Remember when I gave a sneak peek to other dry eye diagnostics here? Here's a sneak peek to the other signs that are just as important. These include tear osmolarity, inflammadry, MMP9 biomarker, in this video, I will touch upon the first two in that short list, the tear lab and the inflammatory diagnostics in dry eye disease. Let's get right into it. Hey everybody, my name is Dr. Natalie Chai. This channel brings you the latest science-based education and treatments in dry eye disease, myopia management, and specialty contact lenses to help you understand why it should matter to you for optimal eye health, function, comfort, and even beauty. In my previous video in the dry eye disease series, I shared my top five clinical signs of dry eye disease. Now that list were signs requiring no fancy instruments where optometrists or ophthalmologists really only needs their silt lamp microscope, yellow dye, and their pair of eyes. To me, it is a very powerful list and the presence of any of those signs under the microscope can lead to the official diagnosis of dry eye disease. Today, I'll be sharing on two exciting diagnostics tools that has changed the landscape of the dry eye workup for a lot of optometrists and ophthalmologists, including myself. To properly introduce the tear lab and inflammadry, it is important to remind ourselves what the definition of dry eye disease in the T FOS DUCE 2 reports is. So dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film and accompanied by ocular symptoms in which tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage, and neurosensory abnormalities play etiological roles. Let's zero in on hyperosmolarity and ocular surface inflammation. These two elements were recognized as key elements contributing to the pathophysiology process, triggering and perpetuating the vicious cycle. Let's start with hyperosmolarity. Number one, hyperosmolarity in dry eye disease. In basic terms, hyperosmolarity describes the high concentration of salt in one's tears. So you can think of the tears having less water content and therefore more salt content. The TFOS DUS2 report recognized tear osmolarity as the central mechanism causing ocular surface inflammation, damage, and ultimately symptoms. Tear hyperosmolarity arises as a result of reduced aqueous or water tear flow from the lacrimal gland or increased evaporation from the exposed eyeball or both. As you may remember, the greatest challenge in dry eye disease is determining a reliable and objective method to measure its presence and its severity. The reason it has been super difficult is because there is a disconnect between the symptoms and the signs it presents. But the one thing dry eye patients do have in common in the literature is tear film hyperosmolarity. To that end, hypoosmolarity is the only characteristic of dry eye that can be objectively and reliably measured. Osmolarity testing has been declared the gold standard of objective dry eye diagnosis and the single best marker of disease severity. Number two, osmolarity measurement methods. The second challenge after determining the central importance of hyperosmolarity and dry eye disease diagnosis was how were we going to measure it and to measure it reliably and accurately. In medicine, a lot of what we know comes from the invaluable research performed in laboratories. But the common saying that knowledge is power is really not useful if we're not able to apply that knowledge in a clinical setting to help treat patients. So researchers and clinicians over the years have put their brilliant minds together to invent and design a test that makes sense in a clinical setting. Which brings us to the Tear Lab Osmometer by Tear Lab Corporation. Number three, Tear Lab. The Tear Lab uses a handheld sampler with a single use microchip embedded with gold electrodes that measures the electrical impedance of the tear fluid sample in a tiny channel in the chip. To perform the test, the clinician uses the handheld sampler to collect a very small sample of tear fluid. The patient is asked to look up and the tip of the device is positioned along the lower lid closest to the ear. The tear meniscus is absorbed by capillary action. The device is then docked into the reader which calculates and displays the osmolarity measurement in just a few seconds. A recent paper compared the tear lab osmometer against the freezing point depression method, which is the industry gold standard, and determined that the tear lab method correlated well with the freezing point method. The tear lab is a very precise test showing that it is even more precise than universally accepted point of care tests such as in cholesterol and glucose or blood sugar in diabetes. Number four, 
measure, interpreting the results. The higher the numeric measurement, the drier the eye. It's measured in milliosmoles per liter. The tear lab defines an abnormal osmolarity as an elevated reading when it is greater than 300 milliosmoles or when the difference between the two eyes is greater than 8 milliosmoles per, per liter, indicating instability of the tear film. The results indicate whether a patient has dry eye, including the severity. However, it cannot tell you the reason why the patient has dry eye. In other words, we are unable to tell if the patient has aqueous deficient dry eye or evaporative dry eye. This is where additional clinical tests and questionnaires in summation are all important to further classify the type of dry eye or in the case of a normal osmolarity in a patient with symptoms that it could be just mimicking dry eye disease. In addition to diagnosis, this is an excellent objective method to track the progress and the effectiveness of the dry eye treatment strategy over time. This is one of the tests that I repeat at every follow-up I have with my patient. Ideally, we're looking for a gradual decrease in the numeric value from the baseline during diagnostic testing to direct the course of the dry eye treatment. This is a great tool to help the patient visualize the improvement in the signs of dry eye. A lot of times, the relief in symptoms lag behind the improvement in the signs of dry eye. In other words, we will first see the improvement in the signs way before the patient even experiences relief from their symptoms. So having a number or quantitative value for the patient to see can be very encouraging on this long journey to dry eye relief. Ocular surface inflammation. Number one, metalloproteinase 9 or MMP9. Inflammation is another important known component of dry eye pathophysiology and helps us zero in on if a patient may respond well to an anti-inflammatory strategy of dry eye treatment. Dovetailing from our discussion on tear hyperosmolarity, we know that increased tear osmolarity triggers the inflammation cascade of distressed corneal epithelial cells. Research shows MMP9 is elevated in the tears of dry eye patients and increases proportionately with ocular surface dryness. Now the irony is also we know that not all patients with dry eye have significant ocular surface inflammation. So this really makes things super confusing sometimes. Number two, inflammadry by rapid pathogen screening. To perform to perform the inflammatory test, the clinician or technician collects a small tear sample from the everted lower lid exposing the palpebral conjunctiva. The kit includes individually packaged sample collector, which is a fleece collector, a test cassette, and a buffer vial. The clinician uses a series of dabbing action across the entire span of the palpebral conjunctiva until adequate saturation is achieved on the fleece. The sample is then joined with a test cassette and then activated by the buffer solution using capillary action for about 20 seconds. We set the test sample and cassette aside for about 10 minutes and during this time we carry on with other dry eye diagnostic testing. The inflammadry provides highly accurate results. 85% sensitivity and 94% specificity. Sensitivity of a test is the ability for it to correctly identify those with the disease, which is a true positive, and specificity of a test is the ability for it to correctly identify those without the disease, a true negative. Number three, interpreting results. The results are read in a similar way to at-home pregnancy tests, where it essentially gives you a yes or no answer. If the test is done correctly, there will always be a blue line. This is known as the control line. The test results can be either, number one, a solitary blue line. This is indicative of a negative result, but it does signify an accurate and valid test. Or number two, a blue line along with a solid red line, and this is a positive test. Or number three, a blue line along with an uneven, incomplete, or even a faint presence of a red line. This is also a positive test as well. A positive test indicates the presence of MMP9 greater than 40 milligrams per milliliters in the tear sample, and so anything below that will register as negative. We also need to remember that MMP9 is a non-specific marker in that there are many conditions other than dry eye can produce a positive result. Similar to the tear lab, the inflammadry can only detect the presence of ocular surface inflammation. However, it cannot differentiate what is causing it. And so again, we must still rely on other diagnostic information. However, sometimes just knowing there is inflammation on the ocular surface is already helpful enough when designing the initial treatment protocol when we may consider anti-inflammatory topical options such as Ristasis and Zydra. In my clinical diagnostic testing,
testing, the Tear Lab and Inflamadry test are one of the first tools that I perform. The addition of these two diagnostic tests has transformed the way that I view dry eye disease and has helped me with efficiency and increased the success of treatment. The exciting thing is that through the grapevine, there is word that there will soon be a device that incorporates the two into one testing system. That's it for me today. I hope you learned something and enjoyed watching more of the hands-on and clinical aspect of dry eye disease. If you look forward to learning more in my future videos on everything dry eye, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click the notification bell to receive reminders on my new YouTube video every Thursday. Thanks for stopping by. Take care of your eyes and we'll see you next time.